Welcome to our second episode of Market Share, connecting the world of real estate and delivering insights from the industry's greatest game changers and thought leaders. My name is Jason Hardy, managing partner with Chatterson. Chatterson is a leading real estate marketing firm that has been serving customers across every asset class of the industry for the past 12 years. Our goal in creating market share was to help bring our industry together by engaging real estate's best and brightest to deliver you useful and insightful content that matters. A big thank you to our media sponsor, PropMoto, and our industry partners from across the country for supporting our conversation. BOMA, Informa, NAOP, Urban Analytics, the Urban Land Institute, and Chatterson. Our topic today is silver linings, opportunities on the horizon. We'll look at the bright side of the major changes happening in the real estate industry as a result of COVID-19. What are some of the positive outcomes and what opportunities will these changes bring for the various asset classes within the sector? I would like to introduce you to our guests today. First, Sheila Botting, Principal and President with Avis and Young. Sheila Botting recently joined Avis and Young as President of the New America's Professional Services Practice that includes the wide range of services for both corporate occupiers and investors alike across the private and public sector. Sheila is also a member of Avis and Young's Global Real Estate Executive. It's also noted that Avis and Young is the world's fastest growing commercial real estate service firm, and her addition is a sign of yet further growth for Avis and Young. Through her executive real estate career, Sheila has led a number of multidisciplinary real estate teams and assignments across the industry, earning a reputation as one of the go-to global commercial real estate leaders. Sheila has held leadership roles with both Deloitte and Cushman and Wakefield and has been honored with multiple degrees and industry awards. Next, L.D. Salmonson, co-founder and CEO of real estate data network Cherry with headquarters in New York. Prior to founding Cherry, L.D. served as executive director of the Oppenheimer's Private Shares Group after Oppenheimer acquired Greencrest Capital, a firm he co-founded to enable pre-IPO transactions in some of the largest private technology companies in the world, including Facebook, Twitter, and Uber. Finally, Dr. John McComber. John is a senior lecturer in the finance unit at Harvard Business School. His professional background includes leadership and executive roles in real estate, construction, and IT. His teaching combines infrastructure finance, investing in resilience, economic development, and the impact of new technologies on the real estate sector. Mr. McComber is the former chairman and CEO of the George B.H. McComber Company and remains a principal in several real estate partnerships. Sheila, LD, John, thank you for joining us this morning. Let's begin on our first question on a great timely topic of healthy buildings. I've been having many heated discussions lately about the future of commercial and the frictionless environments that people are seeking out. I believe it's achievable, however, these are unchartered waters for most businesses today. Our industry is tasked with a monumental challenge in developing and activating strategies for getting people back to work and back to life safely. John. You recently co-authored a very timely book entitled Healthy Buildings, How Indoor Spaces Drive Performance and Productivity. What role do you feel healthy buildings have in attracting, retaining, and enhancing the performance of employees? And what are the real benefits and ROI for property owners, landlords, and employers? John? Well, thanks, Jay. And thanks for having us all today. We're really pleased to be with you. Uh, I'll give a pre-COVID answer and a post-COVID answer because, of course, the world is completely different. The book uh, came from the kind of evolution between thinking about energy efficiency and then looking at sick buildings, thinking about green buildings, and ultimately healthy buildings. My co-author, Joe Allen, works on infectious diseases at the Harvard School of Public Health, and he spent a lot of time thinking about sick buildings, which often come from essentially taking efficiencies, thinking about we're going to save a couple pennies on fans and filters and um, not realizing that this is costing lots of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars on the productivity side. So we think that healthy buildings will be sort of the next evolution after green buildings because ultimately we don't care that much about whether the building is healthy. We want the people to be healthy. So Joe's research and cognitive effects showed that in a double-blind experiment, if people had 
excess levels of CO2 in their office, their thinking processes, their thought process were uh, verifiably and quantitatively different. So that if you were in a really stuffy conference room, say with 1,500 parts per million of CO2, you really weren't thinking as well strategically. Your memory wasn't as strong. So for me, being a real estate guy, I thought, this is something we need to think about. So um, we started to think if the base building had these healthy building attributes, will the, will the tenants understand this? Will they think that if your income statement has maybe 50% of the cost having to do with payroll, 20% having to do with rent, and just 3 or 4% having to do with energy, why are we spending all this effort saving 3% or 4% on energy when if we could be slightly more productive or slightly more healthy, it would have huge impact on even revenues and also on costs? In the post-COVID world, of course, this is even more important because the magnitude of the downside of a sick building is so much greater. It's not just a couple of sleepy days. It's not just a couple of, of days with the sniffles. It's weeks and weeks out of work. So our recent Harvard Business Review article about what makes an office building healthy talks about how we think that these aspects are going to be advantages for the best landlords and the best landlords will be able to attract the tenants who in a down market are the tenants who can pay and the tenants will have a lot of bargaining power. So uh, we've proposed a number of very specific health performance indicators that might be able to make people comfortable back in the space. This kind of thing is all about data analytics and sensors. So the question of whether tenants are really going to be looking for an objectively healthy building and how they will know is one that I think is really suited to all three of us on the panel today. You know, healthy buildings are a really important consideration to the large corporate occupier. And those folks that run corporate occupancy for, for example, banks, professional services firms, care a lot about you know green buildings and now more importantly healthy buildings well the certification may not be as important for their employees and the productivity of their employees is an increasing factor in fact some of the research that we've done has shown that green buildings can contribute anywhere from 20 to 30 percent in productivity so back to some of the earlier points made this is really crucial for the corporate occupier so paying that small premium to get a, a you know a, a qualified healthy green building is a really important consideration. Again, adding to property value and, and the investor return. It's amazing getting people back to work and making them feel comfortable. Couldn't be more important. LD, over to you. Um, your organization, Cherry, is really transforming how data is captured and analyzed for many of the asset classes within the real estate sector today. What are the performance metrics or efficiencies developers and their financial partners are really looking for? Are healthy buildings one of these metrics? Well, currently it isn't, right? So when we think about what building operators think about it, it comes down to ROI. So things that have immediate ROI, whether it's in a cost structure or it attracts tenants with a higher value, maybe at a higher price per square foot, uh, those things matter to them. And if we take a little, um, you know, kind of lead from previous examples, maybe um, energy efficiency or green buildings, quote unquote, um, it means different things to different people. Um, we learned a few things. First of all, we learned that um, certifications don't make much of a difference um, in, in themselves, right? The consumer, it, the, the, that consumer that really cares about the building being green is going to look beyond a certificate to things that really matter to them. And that consumer that doesn't care one way or another, um, you basically had kind of an add-on effect which doesn't really affect price, like a bundling effect. Um, and that's a bit unfortunate because um, there wasn't a very strong consumer base that told you know, the building operators, you know, we want these things as a society, as a tenant, provide these things and that would you know command a higher uh, rent. We haven't seen that in the data. Um, obviously, it's too early to say um, anything intelligent right now about what we're seeing from the uh, pandemic data, um, but I have a sneaky suspicion that unless it's gonna be a regulatory issue, in which case that just changes the way we behave. You have to have a certain distance between people. You have to have certain things that will just reshape and then healthy buildings are the only buildings that operate. Um, otherwise, um, maybe not so much. Yeah, fantastic. Sheila, over to you. Uh, you know, this is timely. A few recent articles came out, one from Jeff Olin with Vision Capital in Toronto, another one from ex-Google CEO Eric Schmidt, predicting companies will need more office space coming out of this pandemic and not less. As a former senior partner at Deloitte, your vision guided a transformation to the workplace of the future, um, including the shrinking of square footage allocation to each full-time employee. What are your feelings on what direction uh, office space will really go coming out of this pandemic, Sheila? 
In fact, there's a huge uh, continuum of CEOs that have very different views on that. Recently, Jack Dorsey of Twitter came out saying that his employees can work from home forever. Yes, yes, I saw that. Similarly, Mark Rose, a CEO of Avis & Young, said that his employees or the employees of Avis & Young could work from home until Christmas. And many others have followed that lead. What it really means is that in the war for talent, flexibility is required in the workplace. Workers, either pre-COVID or post-COVID, suddenly want the ability to work from anywhere, anytime, in any place that they would like. And in fact, a lot of the research has shown that 85% of employees would prefer the opportunity for remote working some of the time in order to consider working for an employer. So again, it becomes flexibility, um, in the war for talent and one size does not fit all. I think that's a really important consideration as we think about the corporate occupancy going forward. Oh, thank you, Sheila. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. We're in the middle of that discussion in our offices right now. Professor McComber, uh, keeping with the topic of healthy buildings, you recently co-authored a case for Harvard Business entitled A Tower for the People, 425 Park Avenue. You talked about a building in New York that was poised to be the healthiest office building in New York City, if not the world. What is so special about this building and what are some of the trade-offs in financing and marketing healthy buildings and who is really going to pay for all of this? Sure, and that is um, the question of the day. So the 425 Park Avenue case is about uh, the first new office building on Park Avenue in generations. And the idea of the developer, LNL uh, Holdings, is to try and, and really argue it's the healthiest building in New York. Part of the reason we wrote this Harvard Business School case study was to talk to both of the populations that Joe Allen and I teach. So for me, with Harvard Business School students, I want them to be thinking about, here are the health issues that exist in buildings and the productivity issues. When we teach it to his students at the School of Public Health, they're all bought in on that, but they don't understand how the real estate industry works. They don't understand the players and the, and the capital markets and the financial structure. So the idea was to, to put that together and say, what do you have to believe? So the goal for us as teachers is to propagate learning and say, well, okay, maybe here's an elite building for elite tenants by an elite developer on an elite street in an elite city. How will this, is this just a one-off or will this move out and eventually be adopted by other people the way that elevators or air conditioning or green buildings were? So that's the teaching objective. The uh, case study lets students look at a couple of what ifs. One is around capital expenditures for in the base building for having more capacity primarily for fresh air to bring in outside air to do more filtration to run higher quality fans and have that available for tenants we have a number of ways that students can think about the incremental cost although generally it's maybe one or two percent of the capital cost of the building if you do it at the beginning the second question then is will tenants care so if this actually matters then presumably tenants would pay more rent to get more of the benefit. And it's one of those classic negotiation questions. If you create value, how's the value apportioned? And so uh, if the tenants could, would pay you know, three or 4% more rent, then it's a fantastic incremental investment. Maybe they won't pay three or four, maybe they pay one or two. Maybe there's only a handful of tenants who care about this today. Maybe more tenants will care in the future. So what we want the students to think about and ultimately professionals to think about is how much will this matter? So there are two uh, big uh, gambles, really, that the developers are making at 425 Park Avenue. One is that uh, a lot of people will ultimately care about the building that's demonstrably healthy. They think that this will be uh, the future of, of uh, real estate. And of course, that's yet to be seen. The second is uh, in multiple market situations. So almost the last quote in our case study is from David Levinson saying, we believe that with this healthy building in an up market, we'll get a premium. And in a down market, we'll get the tenant. So they feel that they future-proofed in a sense to say, this building is demonstrably healthier. And even if we don't get a premium, at least people who are still paying their rents will come to us. Well, I guess now we're gonna find out going forward in this market. Wow. That is definitely going to be the case. I mean, what a competitive landscape that we're moving towards. And that sort of leads us into our next topic that I want to move to, which is really talking about the new workplace. Um, we're hearing a lot lately about the new normal, and it hasn't really even begun yet. At our Chatterson offices here in Calgary, we're still staying home and holding off to see how this whole thing plays out. 
we're in the midst of a working plan, but nothing really has been written in stone. Sheila, I'm going to go to you. Part of your role at Avis & Young is an advisor on workplace strategy in which you have a wealth of experience. What changes are being implemented in response to COVID-19? And how do you see these sticking around after companies and staff return to work? Do you see this trend of unassigned seating uh, growing in popularity, uh, given a new top of mind focus on employee health and safety? Oh, thanks, Jason, for a great question. And in fact, workplace was evolving long before COVID-19, and it's really accelerated um, individual's understanding of where work uh, is going. If you think about it, digital disruption, mobile devices, technology, laptops, has allowed us to work anywhere, anytime. People are no longer tethered to their desks, moving paper from the left to the right. Suddenly they're able to move around. And so as a result, the way that people work was changing long ago before, before this COVID um, issue. At the same time, when we would do utilization studies, the technical term is the bums and seats analysis, we found that the average workplace was empty 50 to 60% of the time, whether that was in a very rural location or downtown a major city. And so if you're the corporate occupier, you automatically say, why am I spending money on space that's empty because my employees aren't sitting at their seats? And that gave rise to this whole notion of unassigned seating. I was fortunate to travel around the world to Australia and to Europe before we ventured into the program and was able to see how other enterprises you know, investigated and embraced unassigned seating. And what most of the companies found was that employees loved it. It completely balanced against the desire for flexible work schedules and allowed them to then move around the offices. 96% of people who've been in an unassigned seating environment would never go back to the dark ages of being tethered to your desk and to your phone. So what that means is that at work, you move around constantly, um, whether it's to a meeting room, your, you know, a, a sit down private area or somewhere else to collaborate with your, with your colleagues. And we find that that in fact drives productivity for many organizations. So you get the one, two opportunity. On one side, you reduce your occupancy costs anywhere from 20 to as much as 40% along with the productivity gains. So that was the before COVID. Now COVID's happened and we've of course had the largest experiment globally for everybody working remotely. You know, we're on this conference call today and we're able to enjoy a great interaction from many parts of North America. So if you can do some of your work in that fashion, why wouldn't you do it more frequently? It allows you to have a flex work schedule, the balance between work and life, and it's actually pretty nice. So then it begs the question, what is the role of the office? When you do go to work, what do you go to work for? And what is the purpose? Is it a place where you're going to move paper from left to right? Absolutely not. Is the campus kind of environment where you might engage with people? Probably it's moving toward that scenario. So then the next question becomes, well, what about managing the workplace? How do you manage that activity to provide you know, health and wellness for the employees in that environment. So having, you know, uh, workplace management systems and platforms based on data analytics to know who's moving around at what parts um, of the workplace, um, having, you know, dedicated spaces for the days that you are in the workplace and you can make sure that they're clean and that they're of safety standards for the individuals using those spaces the whole six foot distancing um, requirement is being planned out in many workplaces as well. So all of those things are being factored in today. It still doesn't mean you need to tether somebody to a desk. One of my big questions is going to be around property management for elevators, for washrooms, even mass transit and some of those implications that I think in, in our post COVID world, we'll still need to consider some of those implications. Next, I want to move on to a, a pretty important topic, the topic of big data, and it's really its critical role in guiding the decision-making process in our industry today. As real estate marketing gurus here at Chatterson, measurement analytics have always been big buzzwords for years. It's really hard to convince clients today across all sectors that we work for to pay for things they can't measure or see tangible benefits from. LD, 
you're working with some of the real estate industry's leading companies to provide AI solutions to improve investment and underwriting decisions. What blue ocean opportunities uh, is this data uncovering for some of your customers? Well, by definition, the entire market's still a blue ocean since no one's really connected any data in the first place. Um, the low-hanging fruit is still some basic things, right? So being able to take all my internal data from my operational and financial systems and leasing systems, right, and taking all this external data available to me, whether that's market data from vendors, uh, public data, or other types of sources, whether it's user-generated data as well, and once I've merged that data together, I can start answering some pretty basic questions that, that sound basic, but they're kind of complex today, right? What do I own? Where do I own it? Um, what is my exposure to multifamily? What is my exposure to certain risks, right? If What other correlated or non-correlated risks might affect uh, things that I'm doing in my day-to-day -day process? Um, that's still a low-hanging fruit. Um, from there, we'll move into some more exciting things, which are now that I'm moving into new markets, which markets are more similar to the ones that I've currently done well in, right? If I've done well in really good markets in multifamily and, for example, certain type of AMI, let's look at other places outside that might meet the same type of characteristics so I can do better. Or maybe certain assets within those markets that are more likely to, to outperform the market, right? And the end goal is really to say, um, here's a decision support system which says, um, given all the data that you have access to from all of your sources, and given all of your past decisions and given all of your assumptions about this specific underwriting or investment, what is the likelihood of this event taking place? And maybe you, you make a few better investments on one end of the, the spectrum, you, if you make a few less bad investments on the other end of the spectrum, and on average you're batting a little better, right? That's the expectation that we should have over the next few years. That's a really good expectation because that means a lot of ROI driven in the right places. Um, especially in some of the things that we discussed earlier. Um, are tenants able to really demand um, better and more healthy buildings? If the data is connected, I can answer that. And my guess is probably yes. We just are, are really having a tough time to answer today because the data is not connected in a way that allows us to answer that easily. John, um, you've written on the difficulty of smart city implementation without public-private partnership. Uh, recently, Google-backed Sidewalk Labs pulled the plug on their highly anticipated Keyside project in Toronto, citing unprecedented economic uncertainty. The project was estimated to cost more than a billion dollars. Do smart cities really remain a viable endeavor of the future for the real estate sector? Thank you for asking about smart cities. I've written a lot about smart cities that um, essentially they don't exist. They are hype. And they are hyped by software vendors and by uh, some politicians and um, by some developers. You can call anything a city. You can call Circuit City a city. It's not a city. Um, the big obstacle from the vendor point of view is who's supposed to sign some giant purchase order and what are they going to buy? Now that said, there's no question there are components of smartness within cities. So I absolutely advocate a component approach that really depends on what the city is. It's one thing if it's in New York, it's another if you're Legos. Some of the components of smart cities are to move bits. So you'll hear about public response, you hear about voting, education, restaurant recommendations, things like that, largely ways that uh, people with disposable income spend their disposable income. That's moving uh, bits in smart cities. The other component of cities is moving atoms. Like atoms are hard to move. They are compressible, they have mass. This is like water, like waste, like food, like buses, like people are moving atoms. There's lots of ways in which components of smartness can help cities perform better and help citizens do better. Some of the best examples are around just uh, demand-based scheduling of buses and trains. So. In theory, there's a lot more throughput available for exactly the same amount of tarmac and asphalt by using predictive analytics and some concept of how people move around. So this ties very much into LD's realm of sensors and analytics. Those are also the kind of things where there are real revenues available from tariffs from water and transit or real cost savings available from garbage collection or from uh, stormwater. So they lend themselves very well to public-private partnerships where there's some kind of success-based uh, pricing. So uh, broadly, I think that the nomenclature of smart cities is really distracting and unfortunate. But I also think that there's tremendous opportunity going forward, particularly now in this economic situation. We know governments anywhere are going to have any money, but there's a lot of private capital in the world looking for yield. There are ways to invest in situations that help the, move, the traffic move better in Mumbai or help the water move better in Jakarta or help people feel more comfortable that they're safe on the subway in New York. 
It's fantastic, John. P3 looks like it is the way of the future, maybe the only way for some of these cities. Speaking of cities, I want to talk a little bit about the future of cities. Given everything that's going on around us these days, it's really hard not to sit back and think about the many transformations cities will undergo in the coming months and years ahead. I believe this pandemic will forever change where and how consumers choose to live, work and play. We are already in discussions with many of our residential customers and clients right now about what the future holds for communities, homes and, and living in general. Um, we're in the midst of a massive paradigm shift and many may disagree, but I, I do see pent up demand for housing in particular. Um, LD, uh, Sheila, I'd like to kind of conclude with you on this one. Thinking about city planning and more broadly what effects uh, will this massive remote working experiment have and where people choose to live and how community developers across all asset classes in the real estate sector uh, come together to build communities. LD, why don't we start with you? Sure, so I think the range of outcomes here is pretty broad, right? So one, one edge of that paradigm could say that um, we're going to be leaving the cities as we know it, you know, um, like for, former anti-urbanists of, of past decades and we'll, we'll go out into the country um, and we'll see a, re, you know, a, a revitalization of, um, of kind of the, the state side. I've, I've seen some folks already speaking about that. Um, Redfin um, CEO put out a little um, teaser about some of the data that they see that, that hints maybe to that in a very small scale. Um, the other edge of the paradigm is we end up forgetting, um, like we always forget things as humans. For example, the H1N1 virus that we seem to forget that affected you know, more than a billion people around the world just a few years ago. And we go back to normal, whatever that means. And maybe a lot of trends accelerated over the, that time, but you know, we've reverted to somewhat um, um, to a mean. Um, it's a very you know, broad um, range of outcomes, and it's very hard to, to be um, um, accurate in predicting where, where we fall on that line. I will say this though, either way, you're gonna end up with really good opportunities for the industry. Um, if it ends up that cities remain you know, king, quote unquote, in an environment where we have really um, low interest rates and low inflationary rate or, or not out of control inflationary rate, that's gonna lead to a lot of investment and maybe interesting models there. And to the extent that we have a new normal, well, that's even you know even greater of an opportunity for you know all the real estate folks is now we have to reinvent spaces, rebuild, rezone, right? All of these new things. So either way, um, the smart folks in our industry are going to um, do some really cool things in the future. Amazing, LD and Sheila. What are your thoughts on that future of cities? Uh, so I have two comments with respect to future of cities. The first one is related to big data. If you think about the buildings that we operate, you know, many of them have been operated in a very traditional fashion. Suddenly when you layer in analytics on space utilization, on demographics for the building, and you then bring that into a smart city equation, it allows the municipalities to operate the cities more efficiently. Our real estate industry, and in fact the public sector as well, tends not to be as advanced in technology as some other companies would be. So there's a tremendous opportunity toward modernization. We've also found that in the development industry, um, and in transactions, think about the average transaction, you know, buy sell transaction has got 16 participants, you know, the buyer, the seller, the mortgage lender, the insurance folks, and so on. Similarly, in the development, there's many different components through the construction pricing. The second that you layer analytics and, you know, smart tools to that process, you drive down the cost structure, making housing affordability that much better, making all kinds of other things much more efficient. So smart is very much part of our future, however you define smart. When you think about markets and how markets behave, um, and certainly in our post-COVID market, on one extent you could say everybody's going to leave downtown and go to suburbs or countryside or wherever. And in fact, post 9-11, we had some of those same um, ex you know, experiences where folks said they no longer live in high-rise buildings. And many corporate occupiers said they prefer to be on the lower floors of those buildings. I think the answer at the tail end of this is that flexibility applies, giving people, corporate occupiers, the choice to locate wherever they want. 
you can see a flourish of the suburbs in this in this post covid world because employees will want the ability in the short term to at least drive to work if they choose to go to work during the day and you can easily see uh, locations further away an hour two hours away becoming that much more popular it plays into the housing affordability opportunity for millennials and next generation and it also plays into you know geographic distribution the bottom line is that flexibility is really the key to the future and embedding flexibility in any of our business models and outcomes for people within the real estate world. Thank you so much, Sheila. It seems to be flexibility, maybe the overarching theme of our discussion today and opportunities on the horizon. I want to end our discussion today with just a couple bonus questions. They're off the cuff. Uh, you probably weren't prepared for them, but I want to know, and I'm going to go around and we're going to start with, with you, John. Um, uh, first question is, uh, two questions for you. What book are you currently reading during this time? And the second question is, what's the first thing you're going to do when you come out of this pandemic? So I'm reading two books right now. They're a little bit different. Um, one is by my colleague, Rebecca Henderson. It's called Re Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. And you can imagine for us teaching in Harvard Business School, we're interested in how can the, the tools of capitalism be used to continue to create value for people, but to create value in an equitable way and to uh, address some of the inequities in the world. Related or unrelated, I guess, I'm also reading Moby Dick, <laughs> partly because our uh, the, the American Repertory Theater is put on Moby Dick and partly because uh, one of my children uh, has that as his favorite book. And that leads into the second piece. Um, my children are in their 20s. Uh, I don't see them. So the first thing I'm, I, I see them, they show up in the driveway with their masks and they don't want to infect their aging parents, which is us. So the first thing I'm going to do when this is over is go hug my two sons. Sheila, over to you. So, uh, like John, I'm reading two books right now. Brene Brown's uh, uh, books called The Gifts of Imperfection is wonderful. It talks about vulnerability and shame, which is fascinating. The second book is, is of course, by great Canadian Malcolm Gladwell, Talking to Strangers. Also very good and insightful. Um, what am I going to do following this? I'm going to head north to cottage country and get out on our sailboat. That's the most exciting oh. part. Well, Sheila, I have, I have a soundtrack that's all Katie Lang and Gordon Lightfoot and uh, Joni Mitchell and uh, Leonard Cohen. Awesome. Love them all. <laughs> Love them all. I listen to that set. LD, how about you? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, Read the Proud Highway by Hunter Thompson. It's actually the only Hunter Thompson book that I somehow uh, missed over the years. A, a big fan. Um, Probably uh, just travel. Um, um, a lot of my family and my wife's family is in Israel, and uh, we haven't been able to get back there in a while, so uh, it would be nice to go uh, just see the family and spend a little time with them. Uh, thank you again to our guests, Sheila from Avis and Young, LD from Cherry and John uh, from Harvard Business School. What a super great conversation today. Big thanks to our media sponsor, PropMoto, our industry partners from across the country for supporting our conversation. All those tuning in today, we certainly do appreciate your viewership, your sharing and support during these challenging times. There really is a lot going on out there. Uh, looking out to our next Market Share conversation on June the 3rd. Check out marketshare.tv for previous and upcoming episodes and to learn more about our partners and our previous guests too. Thank you very much for watching.